Hi guys, welcome back to the Burns and Bites series. Uh, again, this is a two-part lecture series on burn wound care and also frostbite wound care. And today we'll also go over a lot of the non-freezing injuries as well. Um, this is uh, originally recorded for the Global Medicine and Molders Medicine tracks at RVU, but uh, this is also really great knowledge for anybody in general medicine, anybody who does uh, international outreach or uh, anybody who just wants kind of the knowledge for rural care. Um, so again, my name is Alex Hetrick and we'll go ahead and get started. So cold injuries. Um, a lot of people think about uh, that kind of stuff as, oh, that's for Everest hikers and that sort of thing. But really, this is going to pertain to almost anybody in healthcare listening to this lecture because this also includes uh, homeless population. Uh, it includes anyone uh, who has had uh, uh, freezing injuries, has had cold exposure, who uh, is out hiking and has extremities frozen, any of that kind of stuff. We're also going to go over uh, pre-freezing injuries as well. So that's just kind of, this, this lecture should apply to most of you and give you a little toolkit on uh, these conditions and what you should do for them because a lot of it is not like how it is in uh, TV shows and you do kind of need to to be a little bit more uh, methodical about it. So just to kind of go over what we're talking about today, so we're talking about true freezing injuries, which is frostbite, the degrees of frostbite, uh, how the passive pathophysiology behind it, what goes on uh, in causing uh, the morbidity of it, and also how you should treat uh, victims both on scene, in transit, and then uh, in the ER, so kind of dividing it between that. Um, we're also going to talk a, a lot about um, trench foot, uh, pernio, and cryoglobulinemia. Barely say that word. Um, all right, so first talking about frostbite. Frostbite is a true freezing injury. Um, it, it depends on the severity of how many ice crystals form and how deep into the superficial, how deep or superficial um, the uh, frozen layer invades into the tissue as to uh, what the outcome for the patient is going to be and also how serious the injury is. Uh, your typical frostbite victim uh, is someone who works or recreates in cold and high altitude environments. So people who are doing um, any kind of work with uh, uh, any of the Wi-Fi or tele telecom companies getting up on high poles, being up in those really frigid areas, working with uh, metal tools, that sort of thing. Anybody hiking in al high altitude areas in colder months. Um, and then uh, anybody who uh, has a has a workplace that requires them to be exposed to these kind of cold temperatures. I mean, even people who are working in the media industry being in um, cold uh, freezers uh, for uh, very long periods of the day or touching uh, metal instruments in those freezers could uh, potentially develop this. Another huge uh, population that you see frostbite in is, are homeless individuals. So uh, especially in winter months uh, in, in city or rural scapes even, uh, homeless individuals who don't have proper clothing, uh, who are sleeping outside um, and just basically have complete exposure to the elements. Um, then you also have individuals who are accidentally trapped outdoors in the winter, people who lock their keys uh, in the house or lose their car keys and, and are, can't uh, move from where they are. Anything like that, accidental uh, being trapped outdoors. Also for anybody recreating outdoors in the winter who accidentally get trapped. Um, people who are involved in avalanches, snow slides, anything like that, into where they can't get back and are stuck in, out in the wilderness and cold for a very extended periods of time. Uh, the most at-risk uh, group uh, for frostbite injury is from 30 to 49 years old, and usually it's those who are um, who who make up that working class who are working in those conditions uh, or recreating in those conditions. And in more than half of er uh, half of case uh, urban cases, uh, the individuals are intoxicated. Again, that is a large. Uh, part of the homeless community, but also a large part is, is uh, people who frequent bars and um, and get blackout drunk and that sort of thing end up passing it out along the sidewalk and are outside in freezing cold temperatures for several hours. So it, frostbite victims can come in all shapes and sizes, all walks of life, basically is what you should know. All righty, let's talk a little bit about the pathophysiology of frostbite. So under normal thermal conditions, 80% of an extremity's blood volume is in the veins of the skin and musculature. So in the veins, not the arteries or arterioles. So the veins, venules, and that side of the capillary system. Um, blood flow uh, 
through typical apical structures, uh, such as uh, nose, ears, hands, feet. They all vary uh, most markedly because of the richly innervated uh, arteriovenous connections. So those are actually uh, what uh, predispose these uh, extremities to um, have uh, the most predisposition uh, to frostbite. They're the ones that freeze the earliest and thaw and and basically are the ones who uh, who have the uh, most uh, complex and uh, deep uh, freezing issues. Um, when the hand or foot uh, is cooled to uh, 59 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, maximal vasoconstriction and minimal blood flow occur. So it really doesn't take getting very cold for that vasoconstrictive action to cause minimal blood flow to occur in your extremities. If cooling continues uh, down to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, vasoconstriction uh, is interrupted by periods of vasodilation. So basically it's your body's response of constricting, constricting, we're, we're protecting the body from losing heat, and then, okay, relax for a minute. Let's, let's let everything uh, perfuse again, and constrict, constrict, constrict. And that's how everything kind of goes along. So periods of intermittent vasodilation amongst the constriction, trying to keep those extremities alive. So this cold-induced vasodilation, CIVD, uh, or also called the hunting response, uh, recurs in about five to 10 minute cycles. And again, it, pro it provides that protection for ind individuals from cold conditions. Now that we've kind of going, go, gone over the structural components um, uh, within the skin, let's go over um, what the freeze-thaw cycles kind of go over and how to classify frostbite. So frostbite is, is pretty much uh, classified by depth of injury. Um, and it's divided broadly into either direct cellular injury or indirect cellular injury. And then amongst these, it's kind of further divided into either the pre-freeze, freeze-thaw, vascular stasis, and late ischemic phases. We're not going to go into that too much because the direct cellular injury and the uh, indirect uh, are kind of the better categories to kind of think of everything through. And once you kind of have those under your belt, you'll understand what um, the pre-freeze, freeze-thaw, and other cycles kind of refer to. So let's start with uh, direct cellular injury. So when you have um, the uh, epidermis dermis freezing, you have extracellular ice formation. So little crystal ice shards forming um, within the layer. You also have intracellular ice formation within the cells, which I'm sure as you can imagine, if you have ice crystal forming within cells that can wreak havoc and actually uh, cause death uh, to the cell. You also have, have cell dehydration and shrinkage. So basically, uh, water is being pulled out of the cells as uh, these freezing ice crystals are forming, and it's causing shrinking of the cells, causing concentration of intracellular components. So if you do get that intracellular ice formation, you're causing even more damage because everything's packed together closely. You also have abnormal intracellular electrolyte concentrations, which can, again, cause uh, uh, components of the cell to start to fall apart, can cause uh, uh, different uh, structures within the cell to shut down function. Um, you can have denaturation, uh, denaturation of the lipid protein complexes. So start having the protein complexes within the cell unravel. Basically, when you get to this point, the cell cannot uh, recover. Cells subjugated to a slow rate of cooling, kind of over hours and hours, um, develop ice crystals extracellularly, um, in the uh, cellular interspaces. So slow cooling, you're getting most of that extracellular ice formation. Rapid cooling, seconds to minutes. So if you are butt naked, jump into a river and then get out and don't warm up properly, seconds to minutes, producing intracellular ice crystals. So that's when you're getting a lot of that cellular damage that is completely lethal to the cell, very uh, much less favorable for cell survival and uh, can cause a permanent death or damage uh, to the cell. So you look at a lot of these individuals go like swimming in ice uh, during the middle of winter and that sort of thing. They have to be very careful because they can cause um, those cells to uh, be permanently damaged, which is good that we have a high rate of cell turnover from the basal layer, uh, the dermal junction and everything. But if you cause enough damage to even that portion, you may not get, get regrowth of that uh, dermal layer and sorry, not dermal layer, epidermal layer, and have to completely uh, heal over those wounds by contraction and epithelialization, kind of like what we talked about burn care uh, in bur the burn care lecture um, just a minute ago. 
Okay, um, so basically this phenomenon subsequently permits a marked and toxic increase of electrolytes within the cell, leading to partial shrinkage and collapse of its vital cell membrane. So basically, uh, this direct cellular injury is caused by ice crystals, both uh, intracellularly and extracellularly. All right, now let's talk about indirect cellular damage. So we talked about direct, that's the ice crystals. Now we're talking about indirect, and this is more of the ischemic changes um, within the dermis that uh, cause uh, uh, death uh, to the tissue. So progressive dermal ischemia is kind of the component of indirect cellular damage. It's secondary to progressive microvascular insults, um, and more severe uh, than it is the than the direct cellular effect actually. So basically this is the long-term effect. What you're talking about is when that vascular, microvasculature gets occluded, gets destroyed, and suddenly you have ischemic damage to all of that tissue it was perfusing. Approximately 60% of the skin capillary circulation ceases in temperatures ranging from uh, 37.4 degrees Fahrenheit to 51.8 degrees Fahrenheit, which is kind of your average um, winter temperatures across most of the US. Um, and then whereas uh, 35 to 40 percent of blood flow ceases in arterials and venules, uh, respectively. So a lot of your blood flow basically just ceases um, uh, when you're exposed in, in these really cold temperatures. Three nearly simultaneous uh, phenomena occur um, after thawing. So this so basically you have your direct cellular damage causing all these ice crystals. We're saying that uh, basically the. Um, dermal epidermal layer was frozen. Now we're talking about thawing after it's been frozen. During the thawing and after the thawing process, you have momentary and initial vasoconstriction of the arterioles and venules, resumption of capillary circulation and blood flow, and then th that doesn't sound all bad, does it? Well, you also have showers of emboli coursing through the mic microvesicles. So basically a lot of those little blood, um, a lot of the uh, blood cells formed rouleau formation, or you had clot formation, or you still have frozen blood going through those uh, microvasculature areas. So that shower of emboli causes occlusion and sometimes complete obliteration of that, uh, those capillaries. So that is where you're getting the damage. And then once you've destroyed or occluded those capillaries, then you're getting complete ischemic, uh, ischemia of that tissue they were supplying. Ultimately, there's progressive tissue loss caused by progressive thrombosis and hypoxia of the tissues. That's indirect cellular damage after thawing of a frozen, um, frozen, of frozen tissue, and that is actually the biggest cause uh, of um, uh, basically tissue loss in frostbite. All right, now that we understand how uh, frostbite kind of causes damage on the pathophysiological level, let's talk about classifying uh, frostbite based on that. Um, so the degrees of frostbite are not uh, determined at initial uh, exposure, but at actually later on uh, after the physical signs have developed. So you can't classify uh, frostbite by how it looks when it first comes in or how it looks on site. You have to classify it after it's thawed and you're seeing kind of the the sequelae of what's going on. So frost nip, which I always think frost nip is the is, is the cute version of frostbite. Basically, it's a superficial and a, it's superficial in the skin layer, so in the epidermal area, um, and associated with intense vasoconstriction. Um, and that ischemia is kind of more what causes the discomfort or any pain or anything. And then eventually it goes numb as well. Symptoms usually respond spontaneously within 30 minutes without any tissue loss. Uh, you may feel a little bit of a uh, uh, burning if put under uh, hot, um, warm water or, or when, while it's warming, but you shouldn't have any uh, kind of damage associated with it. Basically, it's, it's ischemia from lack of blood flow, um, but without any kind of tissue damage. First degree uh, also only affects the superficial layers of the skin, so the epidermis, um, and uh, generally blisters do not form with first degree uh, first bite, frostbite. So um, you'll probably have a lot of redness um, 
uh, after uh, you have thawed fingers, but you won't form blisters and you also won't have any kind of lasting tissue damage. Second degree is kind of getting more into the deeper layers of skin. So getting past that epidermal layer, getting more into the dermal layer and um, and causing um, freezing all the way down to it. Uh, this is where you get blisters forming and they contain cl uh, clear fluid. So we talked about blisters already with burns and it's that separation of the derm dermis and epidermis at the dermal epidermal junction, you're having kind of the same thing here is you're having um, complete separation after freezing uh, down past that dermal epidermal junction. Then afterwards, you're having blister form um, that come up top. Third degree, um, you have complete freezing uh, all the way down to uh, the dermis and possibly under a couple of, of uh, down uh, further into uh, tissue layers. Um, but really you're just getting down to that dermal junction. Um, and blood blisters often will develop as well. We'll talk a little bit more about blood blisters later and what to do for them. Fourth degree is full thickness skin involvement down to the muscle tendon and bone. So kind of like fourth degree burns as well. Um, blisters will contain red fluid and uh, often um, the uh, whatever uh, part was frozen will mummify later on with muscle and bone involvement all kind of desiccating and and dying basically uh, fourth degree often is what you're seeing leading to amputation and such later on okay this uh, these charts are kind of getting ahead of things um, we're going to talk about all this later but really it's just kind of talking about classifications which we just discussed um, and also treatments and um, uh, likelihood of amputation, that sort of thing. Just kind of a general look back that covers a lot of this discussion when you just need a quick reference um, uh, on what you're dealing with. So that's just for your use in the future if you want to look back to any of this. Okay, let's talk about frostbite formation. So the type and duration of cold contact are the two most important factors in determining the extent of a frostbite injury and really what predisposes you to developing frostbite. So the most people develop frostbite not from uh, just ambient temperatures and stuff, but they uh, develop it from touching. So you're getting conduction uh, that's causing uh, the frostbite. So touching cold wood or fabric, not nearly as dangerous as direct contact with metal, um, particularly by uh, raw, wet or even damp hands. This is uh, this kind of results in thermal conductivity between the uh, two materials. So your hand and whatever item you're touching and having that uh, heat transfer away from your hand to the item. And um, basically the more conductive the item, uh, metal and such, uh, the faster heat is gonna be pulled away from your extremity. Uh, that heat as it's being pulled away eventually is gonna call, cause vasoconstriction. And then once you're not getting any warm blood flow back into that extremity, um, then you're uh, just losing heat and not getting any, any um, warmth uh, put back in. Basically, that's what leads to frostbite. Um, see it really common in climbers. Um, see it really common in homeless with uh, extremities uh, outside of any kind of clothing, pushing baskets, that sort of thing. See it in workers hanging on poles, carrying tools, that sort of thing. Kind of already discussed that, but really that's what's causing a lot of this, is this thermal conductivity pulling away from um, from um, these uh, t uh, tissues pulling all the heat away. Um, deep, loose snow, which is traditionally thought to be to insulate from the cold, may actually contribute to frostbite. Um, temperature measured uh, beneath deep snow is frequently much lower than that on the surface. So that's just something I know. M uh, many will think, hey, I can bury myself in, in a bunch of snow and it'll insulate me, I'll be okay. Uh, not quite. That's not quite how igloos work and that sort of thing. So um, kind of beyond the scope of this lecture, but um, I do advise, you know, if you're interested in it, go look and see how igloos work. And it's more insulation uh, from elements and that sort of thing rather than burying. That kind of gets you that thermal um, protection. But um, other contributors to formation of frostbite, wet clothing, uh, any kind of coolants, um, anyone who's a smoker, you're going to get more, you're going to get more of the vasculopathy kind of stuff, especially in the lower legs, um, and uh, can cause, you know, basically um, worse perfusion of extremities, so it makes them much more likely to uh, be susceptible to fro uh, frostbite. Same thing with uh, neuropathy and diabetics. Um, they have poor vasculature just because they have uh, poor um, 
neurovast control and uh, and have worse perfusion as well. So not only are they more predisposed to formation of uh, wounds and stuff on their poor healing wounds on their legs and feet and stuff, but they also are more uh, predispositioned predispositioned uh, to for, forming frostbite as well. And then also any other uh, vasculopathy as well. Um, also, those who overexert themselves uh, increase their uh, heat loss. So this more applies to uh, people in the wilderness, camping, that sort of thing. Uh, lots of exertion causes lots of heat loss. And a large uh, amount of body heat can actually be expanded just by panting. Also, you have perspiration, so you're losing heat that way. Uh, and then also makes worse the problem of chilling because it's making your clothes damp. And that's kind of make, giving, basically it gives cloth better conductivity to pull heat off of you if it is uh, wet. And then um, alcohol consumption also also promotes uh, peripheral vascular dilation, increases uh, heat loss, making the exposed part more susceptible uh, to frostbite. So kind of everything there is just, uh, it might seem a little counterintuitive that uh, vascular dilation would cause loss of heat, but if you uh, get slower flow due to over dilation of, um, of your vasculature that can also um, allow uh, heat to be pulled off you uh, quicker, honestly, and also more systemically. So that also can contribute quite quite a lot to hypothermia systemically rather than just frostbite. But that's just something to keep in the back of your mind. Basically, remember that the most common cause of frostbite is conduct uh, conduction by touching uh, rock metals, anything like that, that pulls heat away from uh, fingers, nose, uh, anything like that. And then also with nose, ears, uh, you're getting a lot of convection where you're having cold wind and ambient air flowing by pulling heat off as well. All right, so we talked uh, quite a bit about pathophysiology, what causes frostbite, how to classify frostbite, but let's talk about how frostbite actually looks to you, either in the acute setting or uh, someone coming in uh, to the ER because it, it's different actually and we're going to talk about why. So frostbite presentation, the coldness of the injured part, um, about 75% uh, uh, of individual, individuals uh, complain about numbness. Uh, so that's kind of the way it starts. They start feeling clumsy, uh, not able to properly grasp things, um, and this is all because of the ischemia following intense vasoconstriction. Um, and while the numbness is present initially, it's uh, frequently followed by extreme pain um, during rewarming. So basically, uh, you're getting uh, reperfusion of all that tissue. The cold was keeping uh, you from like, feeling anything because it kind of numbs the free uh, nerve endings. But once you get reperfusion of that tissue, warming it up, then um, you kind of get the backlash of the ischemic pain. Um, some of you guys know from uh, other instances that, you know, if you use a tourniquet on a leg or something, uh, most patients, you know, I think it's painful at first and they're fine, get used to the tourniquet. And about 15 minutes later, they have extreme pain in the injury. And that's because of the ischemia. The, the tissues are basically crying out for to be perfused. That's what the pain is. And I say crying out to be perfused, but that's literally what it is. The pain is meant to vasodilate the area and uh, bring uh, fresh perfused blood uh, to the area. Now, you're, when your uh, fingers are so cold you can't even feel them, you're not getting this uh, kind of reaction. You're uh, not feeling these free nerve endings going off. You're not getting that perfusion. So then when you warm everything up, get that feeling sensation back and slowly starting to reperfuse it, the tissues are all screaming their heads off, perfuse us! And that, that's kind of where you're getting a lot of the pain from. Uh, and the longer a tissue has been frozen, the deeper the freeze is, the more pain you're going to get with this. So not fun, not fun at all. Uh, pain control is something we'll talk about a little later, but you really need to be uh, acutely aware of it uh, when you start rewarming patients uh, in the clinical setting. Um, clinical appearance of frostbite depends on how quickly the injured patient gets to point of care. So how quickly they get to you and how much thawing occurred between them um, traveling from the point of incidence to you. It's important to note that the appearance they present with is often going to be deceiving uh, because you, they're already going to be experience, uh, have experienced thawing. So you may notice, hey, their fingers are a little red, but everything else looks good. Well, their fingers were 
like really uh white just a little while ago but then they um they were able to warm up on their way in here and uh an hour from now they start forming blisters you know so it's, they're already in that second degree uh frostbite area but they look like they just had a little bit of frost nip so completely deceiving you need to be aware of that that if they have rewarmed on their way to you it's going to be a very different presentation okay um for example patients in the alps who arrive by helicopter within minutes of their injury are present very difficultly differently than Himalayan climbers who have almost completely rewarmed uh during their self descent and um and may be fortunate to arrive at definitive care even several days after their injury. So it's going to look completely different than it did at time of injury. You need to familiarize yourself with what it's going to look like, either in the acute setting, if you're a part of a search and rescue, EMS, that sort of thing, and what uh, different things are going to present with in the clinical care setting. Only a few patients arrive at the clinical care setting with their tissues still frozen. At first, the extremity appears yellowish white or mottled blue, um, and it may be uh, incident and may appear frozen solid even, um, regardless of the depth of the injury. With rapid rewarming, there's almost immediately, almost immediate, you have hyperemia, so really hot red look, and then... Um, and uh, even in the most severe injuries, it can uh, look like this. So even when you have a really uh, super uh, depth of uh, freezing uh, going on, you can uh, have this hyperemia. Sensation returns after thawing and persists until blebs appear. Uh, at this point, um, some effort can be made to assess the severity of injuries, but you still may need uh, a little bit of time to, to kind of really start to assess uh, what it's going to what it's going to look like. Um, after the extremity is rewarmed, edema appears within about three hours, lasts up to five days or longer, depending on the severity of the case. Remember, you're having all these uh, microemboli showering in the capillaries. You're, you're destroying capillaries, you're, you're perforating capillaries, and you're clogging capillaries, causing backflow. All this is going to lead to uh, edema within the extremity. Um, and depending on the severity, uh, it can last for, for several, several days. Um, vesicle and bullet appear about six to 24 hours after rapid rewarming. Um, so again, you may th think something is just a little frost nip, but it actually turns out to be a full on second degree, uh, frostbite, um, because several hours later, Hey, oh, they have bullet form forming. Um, clear bullet, uh, confer a progno a better prognosis than hemorrhagic bullet. More, the clear ones you get more with the secondary hemorrhagic with, uh, the, um, third degree and fourth degree. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, during the first nine to 15 days, severely frostbite frostbitten skin um, forms black, hard, and usually dry eschar. So again, kind of similar to uh, burn care victims, whether or not uh, vesicles are present. Okay. So that's with really severe frostbite. So uh, kind of third degree all um, like on the latter end and upwards to fourth degree. And then with fourth degree mummification uh, forms an apparent line of uh, demarcation as well. Uh, you can get in third degree 22 to 45 days after and uh, uh, with fourth degree you'll see it a little bit sooner as well. Okay, let's start getting into treatment. So we're going to start uh, talking about field treatment, how to do that properly. Often um, when patients present to you in the clinical setting, they will not have done it properly and you're going to have to kind of wing it from there. But uh, if it's you, EMS, or anybody who has been trained out in the field, uh, seeing people with their uh, extremities at point of freezing, um, then this is kind of how you should go about it um, there in the field and how to get them back and transfer them to proper care. So if this is you or anybody um, within your group, Self-rescue in the freezing environment. So first, uh, seek shelter from cold and wind. Drink warm fluids with the can. Um, remove wet clothing. Uh, do not let it stay on you. It's not going to help you. Even if it's a barrier, it's going to actually worsen uh, your condition. Um, take ibuprofen you can. Um, this is kind of going back to um, uh, anti-thromboxane uh, formation, trying to prevent those microemboli from forming. Uh, and attempt self-rewarming. Um, uh, for 10 minutes if you can. And this is before you try uh, try to get out of wherever you are. So these are all, all before you're trying to hike out. Don't try to hike out in white, wet clothes. Try to warm yourself as much as possible before you start. 
Um, if you're at high altitude, supplementation of oxygen is advised. I mean, this is pretty much only for people who are in the Himalayas or really high altitudes, like the Salkantai Trek or stuff like that, that would even be carrying supplemental oxygen with them. But this is kind of, kind of just something else you can do that, that helps. Um, and then, uh, try to avoid any, as much further exposure as you can and, and get to help as soon as possible. So that's just kind of basic self-rescue stuff. So in the pre-hospital freezing environment, so when EMS uh, comes on site, is transporting someone out, that sort of thing, if the transport time will be um, short, so one to two hours at most, um, risk posed by improper rewarming or refreezing. Refreezing is really bad. You do not want to even give a chance for something to refreeze. Those outweigh the risks of delaying treatment uh, for deep frostbite. Okay. If transport will be prolonged more than an hour or two, Frostbite um, will often just thaw spontaneously, especially if, if you have someone warming up in a car and that sort of thing. Um, it's more important to prevent hypothermia um, than to rewarm frostbite rapidly in warm water. So really what you're trying to do in the field is wrap people in warm layers, not pay, paying too much attention to the extremities, not saying put their extremities in, in cold water because we want to keep them frozen until we get them to the ER. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Your priority is keeping that person um, person's core temperature normal thermic because somebody with frostbite is often going to have hypothermia as well. So your job in the field is to get them warm but not pay attention to, to warming their extremities. If their extremities start to warm and thaw, you know, that happens. It's, it, but your priority is still protecting their core temperature. Um, I talked a lot about uh, hypothermia in my last series on um, drowning victims. And so um, we talked extensively about uh, hypothermia. So please uh, refer back to that uh, video uh, if you'd like to hear more about that. So... Again, does not mean that the frostbitten extremity should be kept uh, in the cold to prevent spontaneous rewarming. Um, just expect that frostbitten areas will most likely rewarm as a consequence of keeping the patient warm. Um, what you do uh, have to do is make sure that their extremity does not refreeze at all costs. You cannot let their extremity refreeze because that will cause severe, severe damage on top of what they already have um, and often leads to amputations, that sort of thing. You cannot let um, refreezing occur, okay? Um, if you're in a car, try not to let them hold their uh, hands directly in front of a, uh, a hot warmer or anything, um, but don't directly try to prevent them from letting their extremities uh, thaw and everything. Just don't actively try to thaw them. Don't try to actively prevent them from thawing. Just kind of the easiest way to, to recommend it. If patient is referred from a nearby location, uh, no attempt at field rewarming is indicated. Vigorous rubbing is ineffective and potentially harmful. One, you can damage those tissues. Okay, um, you these tissues are frozen. Uh, you can cause further cellular damage if you're rubbing them together in a frozen state. Um, also, uh, again, referring back to the hypothermia lecture, if you jostle someone or rub them vigorously who has uh, low core temperature, has hypothermia, and, and going on the more severe end of hypothermia, you can cause them to go into cardiac arrest. Do not rub cold people vigorously <laughs> is basically what I'm saying. Um, the extremity should not be intentionally rewarmed during transport. We kind of already talked about that. Um, and should be protected against slow partial rewarming by keeping them away from intense campfires, car heaters, that sort of thing. Um, all constrictive wet clothing should be replaced with dry, loose wraps or garments. Again, once they thaw, they're going to swell. So you don't want anything constrictive on them. If they have rings, uh, bracelets, anything on them jewelry-wise, get it off. Um, extremities should be padded and splinted for protection. Uh, you don't know if there's any kind of other injuries going on. And ibupro uh, ibuprofen 400 milligrams should go ahead and be given uh, on scene. Uh, make sure to uh, recount that to whoever you transfer care over to that that was given and what time it was given. Um, again, this is helping to block some of the inflammatory cascade that can cause um, the thrombus formation in the microemboli, uh, causing more damage.
Oh, this is just a general chart of everything we just talked about. This is Alaska State Guidelines for Pre-Hospital Treatment of Frostbite. Um, it's a quick reference to look back to um, if you have a field journal or something that you uh, have for wilderness medicine, expeditions, that sort of thing. Print this off and keep it with you just to refer back to. But yeah, just we talked over all this and, and it goes maybe a little bit more in depth, but that's general uh, how you should go about it. Oh, congratulations, you finally made it to the emergency room. You can start treatment, what do you do? Okay, so systemic hyperthermia um, should be the first uh, priority on any physician's mind of cold injury coming in. So they gotta, you gotta make sure that the uh, person's core temperature is at least 93.2 uh, degrees or higher um, before you even think about managing the frostbite, okay? That is your priority, hypothermia is bad. If tissues are still frozen after you've uh, confirmed that they are normothermic, um, then you start rapid rewarming re of whatever frozen tissue, usually hands, feet. Um, it's a little harder to do with the nose and ears, but there's way to, ways to kind of go about it. But we're going to kind of focus more on ha uh, hands and feet because that's more of what you're going to be dealing with. So... Um, uh, you're also going to be uh, assessing for any other traumatic injuries, medical conditions that can be identified. So all of this is kind of be done, being done at the same time. Treatment is directed at the specific uh, pathophysiological effects of the frostbite injury. Either, either you want to protect uh, against direct cellular damage or prevent the progressive microvascular thrombosis and, and tissue loss. So basically, preventing refreezing is preventing more direct cellular damage. Um, giving ibuprofen, uh, warming uh, quickly at an appropriate temperature, um, which you should uh, be uh, warming them at 40 uh, to 42 degrees uh, Celsius, is, um, is what prevents you from forming a lot of those microemboli that cause um, the capillary destru destruction and tissue ischemic damage. Okay, so talking about rewarming, the 40 to 42 degree uh, temperature range, um, if you, it's kind of been shown if you adhere to this narrow temperature range, as long as it's uh, easy to monitor, you know, um, is uh, very beneficial uh, to tissue survival, okay? Uh, I mean, you work with what you got. If you can't uh, strictly monitor the temperature of the water, you do what you can. Um, there in the lower right hand, I put a picture of a kind of easy way you can do it. Uh, this is actually a thermometer for taking one's temperature um, uh, below the tongue, and they stuck it in a vat of water. Uh, they figured out what the right temperature was going to be for the flowing water, um, and had it set at that, and then had the patient place their hands in. Uh, again, the flowing water component is quite uh, important because it's what keeps uh, the tub of water at that temperature range and lets you uh, progress with thawing um, at pace, basically. Frozen extremities should be rewarmed until the skin uh, becomes pliable and erythematous. So that basically means you've gotten uh, most of the depth of degree of freezing. Um, and at the most distal parts of the frostbite injury, basically you want you want all that to be pliable. Usually it takes less than 30 minutes for this to occur. It doesn't take long for a human to thaw out, apparently. Um, extreme pain may be experienced during the thawing and um, less contraindicated unless they're having any kind of weird uh, neurological stuff going on. Um, they're comatose, they aren't responding, they're drunk, anything like that. You can go ahead and give um, IV analgesics. So you can give some IV morphine and kind of go from there. Just making sure you're watching their volemic status, making sure nothing is going awry. Um, Rapid return of skin warmth and uh, sensation with presence of erythematous color is actually a favorable sign. So basically it says, hey, we were able to thaw it out properly. Uh, the fact that it's getting erythematous and it's not uh, stained black means we are getting uh, uh, some kind of perfusion to this tissue. Uh, but the persistence of cold, anesthetic, and uh, pale skin, very unfavorable. That means you've most likely dis uh, destroyed all the capillary structure beyond recognition. You are not going to, uh, it's very unlikely you're going to be able to salvage that uh, digit or whatever uh, is no longer being reperfused. So again, rapid rewarming reverses the direct injury of the ice crystal formation in the tissue, um, but it doesn't prevent the progressive phase of the injury. So again, the, those microemboli showering down to those capillaries, destroying them, causing edema, causing uh, tissue schema, all that. Um, all but the most minor frostbite cases should be admitted to the hospital because of this, because of the subsequent continuing damage. Um, victims with minor injuries should be admitted if after rewarming, a warm environment can't be insured for the patient, so homeless, um, 
no patient should be discharged into sub-freezing weather. I know it's it's hard sometimes with um, uh, homeless uh, individuals using um, using the ER as a place to sleep and such, but if they have a freezing injury, your duty is to protect them from refreeze at all cost. That is your goal. Even with a warm car waiting, the patient should always be ma made sure they have proper clothing to be able to go to that car. Um, so this is something to kind of keep keep in touch with. If you're in more of an urban city area, uh, work with the local homeless shelters and see if there's some kind of compromise you can find for discharging uh, such patients and getting them housed and and safe and and preventing refreeze uh, uh, subsequently within the next uh, day or so. Okay, so um, white or clear blisters, um, kind of jumping around here, white or clear, clear blisters are kind of that more superficial injury. Remember, you're getting more of that epidermal, superficial dermal um, area, and um, they're debreeded to prevent further contact of uh, PGF2, alpha, and thromboxane 2 with the damaged underlying tissues. So if you have a clear blister, pop it, debride it, cover it, okay? Uh, you don't want, it will actually contribute to further uh, injury to the tissue underneath because of that, uh, those factors within the clear fluid. Unlike clear blisters, hemorrhagic blisters uh, reflect structural damage to the subdermal plexus. So those capillaries have been damaged, um, destroyed, and is causing that hemorrhagic kind of blister. It's uh, worthwhile to aspirate uh, the uh, thromboxane containing um, uh, fluid out of the blisters, but debriding it can actually uh, promote desiccation of the deep dermis and um, kind of allow the injury to continue into a full thickness injury. So you want to be really careful of this. This is one of those few uh, instances you want to keep the bullet uh, kind of intact. Again, stick a needle in it, drain it, but keep the bullet intact, okay? Uh, tell the whoever uh, it is that, hey, don't mess with this, don't pick at it, don't don't let this come off. We want uh, it to stay as um, uh, insulated as possible so you don't uh, desiccate the injury. Um, Aloe vera gel is actually really useful um, in frostbite. Uh, you can just put it over topically and it kind of helps prevent uh, thromboxane formation um, and uh, kind of uh, prevents uh, further vasoconstriction um, and kind of helps perfusion of the tissue. So um, that actually uh, can kind of help healing. And then also dressings should uh, kind of be a little looser to expect uh, for increasing edema uh, over the next couple of days. Oxygen should also be used to achieve nor, uh, normoxia uh, in the hypoxic, hypoxic patients, but um, this is generally more with your high altitude climbers, that sort of th stuff that you have to be uh, very wary of. Um, but otherwise, uh, it's not something that's uh, a big indicator for most uh, frostbite patients. This is just a quick chart going over some of the drugs, doses, and, and stuff you can potentially use uh, in frostbite patients. Um, a lot of them are um, kind of going after the uh, thrombolytic effects and uh, vasodilation effects mainly. Um, but uh, generally, um, there's uh, pretty much only a couple that are used regularly. Ibuprofen is used um, for its anti-prostaglandin effect. Originally, aspirin was used, but it's a little harder to monitor the appropriate dose now. Ibuprofen is pretty much the standard of care. Um, uh, aloe vera gel, again, um, helps a lot with that anti-prostaglandin effect as well. And then uh, more recently, we've seen more evidence for uh, calcium channel blockers actually being good for improving uh, vasodilation and improving um, perfusion um, uh, within uh, extremities. Now, if you have a very severe frostbite case, you could start to uh, uh, think about um, using TPA, heparin, that sort of stuff to really prevent um, that indirect cellular damage through that, those micro emboli and stuff like that, especially if you have a very large extremity that is experiencing frostbite, say an entire foot or something like that, and severe um, deep fourth degree frostbite or something like that. But generally, um, ibuprofen, aloe vera, and maybe plus or minus, say, calcium channel blocker is kind of going to be uh, your drugs of most use uh, in frostbite patients.
Let's talk about uh, surgical treatments. So everyone thinks, oh, frostbite. If it's bad enough, you have to get amputation and all that. And yeah, I was kind of going towards uh, that route with fourth degree and all that when you have muscle and bone involvement and stuff. Uh, something interesting is very much like burns, frostbite will keep. So um, once it's once the injury has occurred, it, it's not uh, something that is super um uh, what's the word? Uh, it's not something that needs to be treated ASAP. It's not an acute uh, need to get them into surgery for amputation and stuff now. Um, yes, it, with fourth degree frostbite and stuff like that, you can eventually uh, develop gangrene and that sort of thing. But none of these are urgent things. You're wanting to more treat pain and uh, getting them uh, hemodynamically stable uh, and um, having their core temperature normal thermic. That is, those are your goals uh, for frostbite hypothermic patients. And um, for uh, milder cases of frostbite, you dress them and, and treat them how we talked about previously. For very severe uh, cases of frostbite where it's quite obvious they are going to need uh, amputation. There's no reperfusion of the tissues. They remain a dark, dense black. Um, that is something that you can start uh, bringing uh, surgery on board to over the next couple of days. Um, mainly, you're wanting to do pain control at this point. So again, using um, uh, parenteral uh, opioids as you know indicated. Early surgical in uh, intervention in the form of fasciotomy is required um, for compartment syndrome. So again, it, the um, the tissues uh, when you get that deep dermal frostbite that completely obliterates the tissue and leaves behind that thick chunk of uh, tissue that uh, basically serves no purpose anymore can uh, lead to eventual compartment syndrome, that sort of thing. Um, not as... Um, not as prevalent just because usually you have um, uh, the kind of deep frostbite in the very uh, tips of your uh, upper extremities or toes and that sort of stuff. So it takes out the fingers, but it doesn't really do anything more proximal um, that you can get um, more distal compartment syndrome or anything like that. It is something you have to think about, um, especially because it forms kind of the same kind of eschars, that dermal uh, tissue that's just completely dead and, and uh, preventing any kind of further uh, um, perfusion of the uh, tissue around it and stuff. So it is something I play a little bit by ear. Um, and uh, occasionally, early amputation is indicated if you have liquefa liquefaction, moist gangrene, or L overwhelming sepsis and infection. But again, rarely any urgency to intervene um, with uh, fourth degree uh, frostbite. Uh, amputation can usually be undertaken by a surgeon uh, four to uh, eight weeks even at the, after the entry. So really low chances of uh, urgency unless they start developing any symptoms of sepsis uh, or infection. So then you'll wanna kinda intervene uh, more quickly. Um, in vast majority of cases, uh, it's failure to delay surgery. That's actually more of a major source of uh, avoidable morbidity. So you're wanting to really make sure the patient is stable and all other conditions have been treated before you even consider uh, doing surgery. It is not something that um, needs to be handled immediately. All right, let's talk about frostbite prognosis. Um, so on the right here, I actually found images of um, someone who obviously had uh, second to third uh, degree frostbite um, uh, in the top one and kind of uh, and, and kind of progressed on how they healed over and kind of what to expect. Uh, I think these are actually multiple individuals, but kind of this kind of gives you a chart of what to expect with these kind of healing. Um, do notice in uh, day nine, you have a uh, black skin toned individual and where they had those areas of the bully formation and stuff, they lost pigment in those areas. Again, this happens often with darker skinned individuals because the inflammation uh, during the healing phase causes any melanin and um, uh, any melanocytes to actually lose their melanin. And it takes several months for it to come back. Or if that tissue is completely obliterated and, um, and was healed over by epithelialization, they actually may uh, have lost that pigment forever. So that's just something to keep in mind with your darker skin toned individuals and, and what to warn them uh, to expect about. But um, just kind of uh, what you would expect with a second to third degree uh, frostbite um, healing course over, 
uh, six months, and I thought that was actually uh, pretty interesting. So, um, throbbing pain usually begins about two to three days after the rewarming. This isn't including the extreme pain they feel during the rewarming process, but about two to three days after the rewarming, throbbing pain continues for a variable period, um, even after the dead tissue becomes demarcated, so 22 to 45 days. So, it can last quite a long time. After about a week, the victim uh, usually notices uh, residual tingling sensation uh, as a res result of that ischemic neuritis, so inflammation of the, um, of the, uh, neur uh, the um, nerves which, uh, from the ischemia, um, and explains why the sensation tends to persist for longer periods, because uh, nerve damage takes quite a long time to heal. Severity of the injury usually defines the extent of the neuropathological uh, damage, so more... Uh, the deeper the freezing goes, the longer you're going to have this lasting pain for. Um, because different injuries are influenced by so many environmental and individual factors, there uh, may be a great deal of variation in symptoms. So, um, again, kind of with burns, you kind of, uh, you, we call them first, second degree, uh, degree, third degree, all that. Same thing with um, uh, freezing it kind of overlaps a little bit. You kind of get symptoms from different uh, kind of phases of freezing. Again, in that core center, you may have uh, uh, third degree frostbite, where on the very periphery, you only have first degree. So that's something to keep in mind. It is it is a spectrum and something to be aware of. Uh, mainly, you're going to be treating the patient according to what that core site um, uh, depth of injury is. Um, in patients uh, without tissue loss, symptoms usually subside in about a month, whereas uh, those with tissue loss, disablement may exceed even six months. So it all depends on how deep that freeze went and how much tissue death you had. And also, you know, how the the uh, indirect cellular damage from all the uh, thrombosis formation, that sort of thing, if the patient was loaded with ibuprofen or other kind of um, uh, uh, other kind of thrombolytics, um, how that, that kind of helped and, you know, kind of tells you what the extent of uh, damage was. Um, in all cases, symptoms are intensified by warm environment. So patients uh, that are in a warm environment uh, have vasodilatory effects actually start to get some of those paresthesias and neuralgias uh, even more. Um, other sensory uh, deficits include spontaneous burning, electric current-like sensation. So again, this is all coming down to that those nerve injuries. Um, the burning sensation, which uh, usually starts pretty early in the pre presentation, usually subsides two to three weeks um, and usually not present in victims um, uh, with tissue loss. Because if you have the tissue loss, you also had the free nerve ending loss too. So you lose kind of kind of that pain sensation. Um, in victims without tish, uh, tissue loss, the burning uh, sensation may resume on wearing um, shoes or increasing activity. So there are a lot of things that kind of cause in, uh, their uh, symptoms to uh, inflame. Um, the electric uh, current like shock is almost universal in patients. So most patients get it, again, it comes down to that nerve injury. Usually being it, it's about two days after the injury, lasts about six weeks and is really unpleasant at night. So you may need to work with them um, prescribing some um, uh, gabapentin or something just at night, maybe 300 to 600 milligrams uh, at night, just to kind of tide them over um, and uh, kind of get them through. Um, a, all frostbite victims uh, experience some degree of sensory loss um, for at least four years after the injury. Again, this is uh, nerve damage, and nerves grow back slowly. If you have a uh, damaged one, it kind of has to go back to the most proximal point of damage and start slowly regrowing out. Um, that if it's just a short distance away, it can happen. Uh, it can regrow back in uh, several months. If it's a long distance away, you may um, have that damage uh, indefinitely. All right, our last slide about frostbite is going to quickly talk over prevention. So we talked about how it all occurs and what goes on and how to treat it, but how do you prevent it? Um, it may kind of seem obvious, but we're still going to go over a couple of things for it. Um, nose and corneas, particularly difficult to protect from the cold wind and are really vulnerable. So especially if you're doing any anything in high wind environments or you're moving quickly, so snowboarding, skiing, anything like that, make sure you have uh, face coverings like maklava or... Um, or uh, goggles as well um, should be uh, considered in all of these kind of extreme conditions. Um, in addition, men who jog, ski, or otherwise work out in the cold 
may be prone to penile frostbite. You heard me correctly. It makes everyone cringe, but it happens. Um, you can look up some pictures of it. I did not put pictures on this because we're going to YouTube and we are family friendly. But um, yeah, it does not look pleasant at all. Um, it's uh, It happens uh, especially quickly um, when you have been running for a little while. Uh, your short or your inner lining of your shorts is wet from sweat, and then you have wind blowing against you. Um, so basically, you have that convection cooling the damp cloth, and that cl wet cloth uh, kind of pulls away heat from the tip of uh, the penis through conduction. So not fun. Um, and uh, basically, uh, if you want to pre uh, prevent it, basically have a wind resistant uh, uh, outer or windproof outer layer that prevents that cooling of that uh, of that sweat, um, allowing the conduction um, frostbite to occur. Something to be aware of. Um, tight fitting clothing may uh, produce constriction, with, which hinders uh, blood circulation. So a little looser uh, uh, clothing, um, uh, air spaces in between layers actually helps uh, insulate. Um, and remember, wet clothing transmits heat uh, from the body into the environment um, because uh, it basically makes a cloth a better conductor. So uh, make sure any uh, if you're going out for wilderness mat excursion or wilderness excursions or anything like that, um, make sure you actually invest in clothing that uh, is breathable and moisture wicking, that sort of thing. Basically getting water away from you to evaporation without making uh, the actual cloth damp and giving it the, that uh, conductive uh, property. OK, so. Um, Clothes that decrease the amount of surface area might uh, decrease frostbite risk, actually. So uh, mittens are actually more productive than gloves are because gloves have a greatest surface area and prevent air from um, circulating between the fingers. Uh, so that actually uh, can help keep your fingers warm. Poorly fitted boots are actually notorious for generating frostbite uh, injuries, even when you wear uh, kind of excess socks with them. Um, basically, um, you're uh, decreasing your insulative uh, capabilities. We're going to talk about trench foot here in just a second, but just know that you the damp uh, aspect really does apply to your feet as well, even if you have really nice thick winter boots and stuff. If you're sweating a lot into your boots and not changing your socks, it can predispose you for trench foot. Which is our next topic. Alrighty, trench foot. So if uh, most of your parents served in uh, one of the wars, uh, most likely they <laughs> experienced uh, trench foot at one point or another. This was a huge issue for um, uh, the army at one point and to the point where they had to uh, uh, start having classes with their uh, soldiers to teach them how to prevent it and how to properly care for their feet and that sort of thing. In Vietnam, it was uh, particularly terrible because that was more of a uh, kind of more lush, dense rainforest kind of area. So they were constantly having soaked boots, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, this is kind of the start of talking about um, non-freezing cold injury. Um, so you're not actually freezing any of the tissue, but having prolonged um, wet, cold uh, application uh, to, in this case, to the feet um, causes uh, slow uh, vasoconstriction um, within that epidermal dermal layer. Um, sorry, a dermal layer, and uh, eventually causes obliteration of the capillaries. Um, so eventually you get uh, decreased perfusion uh, of the skin and eventually can cause some pretty severe issues. So just kind of going through the, uh, the algorithm with it. So cold or wet exposure, you get vasoconstriction, decreased blood flow, ischemia, um, endothelial damage, loss of vasodilation capability. So eventually, you know, you lose the capability to dilate any vessels remaining and and um, get some cold sensitization to it. The cold and wet exposure also causes local nerve cooling, local nerve damage, and sensory impairment. So you actually lose feeling of your feet. Um, and, and the cold and wet exposure also causes swelling, breakdown of the skin. Um, and so you're actually losing your skin layers uh, faster than you can reconstruct them. So that kind of just kind of gives you an introduction to how it works. Um, and we'll kind of go through on what to expect. So this is just a quick image showing you kind of uh, that progressive um, uh, uh, vascular obliteration, uh, loss of vasoconstriction over um, over uh, several hours to months, and kind of how that how that works. Um, 
So yeah, if you just take, take it's just kind of something to give you an idea of what, what we're dealing with. Um, there at the left, you can see the tissue is much better perfused than there on the very right. It's much more, um, uh, well, whiter, basically. It, it, it's much more pale. It doesn't have that good perfusion to it anymore. It also has lost that ability to vasodilate and to reperfuse those tissues. Right, so trench foot can be basically broken down into three phases, the pre-hyperemic phase, the hyperemic phase, and the post-hyperemic phase. So the pre-hyperemic phase basically consti constitutes uh, the affected limb um, during both during and immediately after the cold exposure. Um, it appears uh, blanched, yellowish white, or mottled. Very seldom does it look blistered. It, it looks pretty much like that uh, that right hand image of the foot. So um, looking pretty uh, pretty uh, white, uh, maybe a little yellowish, especially around the toes and such. Um, maybe a little bit mottled, but uh, yeah, generally that's what that's what you're going to be seeing. The degree of edema during the stage is less uh, severe if the feet are intermittently rewarmed, so rewarming uh, between periods of, of that cold uh, vasoconstriction. Um, muscle cramps are quite common. Pain is rare, so uh, often uh, you'll get soldiers uh, feeling like they're getting cramps a lot more often. They stop for a break, try and rub and warm their feet, and then um, and then they start marching along again until it happens uh, subsequently. Um, the single most important diagnostic uh, criterion is loss of sensory uh, modality. So basically loss of sensation in the feet. Um, it's, uh, it makes it distinct um, uh, from premonitory uh, feelings of extreme cold in the affected periphery, uh, almost invariably in the feet, um, though the hands can be affected too. Uh, so reports from soldiers basically says, oh, it's like walking on air or walking on cotton wool. So that's kind of kind of what you think about. I'd like to think of it a bit, a bit about is if your foot's falling asleep, you try to walk on it um, and just take away that kind of pain component that you feel the zinging uh, and just thinking of not being able to really feel your feet and, and how you're walking. And it doesn't it, it, you're a little bit less coordinated and that sort of thing. And it, it doesn't feel quite right. This is the hyperemic phase, um, usually occurs uh, within several hours after rewarming. Uh, the extremity becomes really hot, erythematous, painful, swollen, and then you have really bounding pul pulses in them. Um, the impairment of micro uh, circulation is pretty evident uh, by delayed capillary refill. And also you can get some little petechial hemorrhages as well. So if you go uh, down to the toes, press on the toes hard, uh, release, you're going to have very slow capillary refills, and then you might see little red, red dots. Uh, along the feet as well, where you had um, little particular hemorrhages. Um, sensation returns uh, first proximally and then slowly returns distally. Um, and then after it returns, it very quickly becomes uh, very severe burning, throbbing pain, um, and which can actually uh, worsen in intensity 24 to 36 hour hours after if you don't go back out in the mush and start marching around again and, and uh, causing the same kind of cold injury. After about 7 to 10 days, the nature of the pain changes uh, from that kind of burning, throbbing to shooting and stabbing. So you're getting more. And, and so all of this is kind of more on the, the nervous side, nerve and irritation side. Um, sensory deficits usually uh, are diminished, but all the paresthesia is really continue. Um, and you can still have a little bit of anesthesia in the very distal toes and the tops of the toes, too. Vibratory sensation is reduced or lost. You're, you're doing quite a bit of nerve damage with this type of uh, cold injury. Uh, proprioception actually, actually retained pretty well, more the uh, vibratory and then also getting uh, aberrant pain sensation as well. Uh, anhydrosis coincides with the extent of uh, sensory loss, so loss of sweating in the feet. Um, uh, skin temperature gradients are absent, uh, and digits are often warm or warmer than the groin or axilla. So basically, really, um, you're having those hyperemic hot uh, feet. Um, when the affected limbs are lower, blood pools turn the extremity deep purple, kind of that color uh, in the right-hand side. You can even see the areas of edema where his socks were. Uh, in the, at the upper right, you're also seeing in the hands quite a lot of edema and such uh, with um, hands uh, prostrated forward. Um, 
But basically, uh, what's happening is you've lost control of your uh, vasculature uh, in the affected extremities um, to the point where it isn't able to, um, uh, you know, properly uh, handle orthostatic change. And so if you have your feet go, uh, uh, pointing downwards, blood is going to pull down. If you uh, suddenly put your legs above your head, blood is going to uh, go back systemically and, um, and drain out of your feet. So it's quite easy to, it's, it's kind of similar to people who are having edema in older age as you're using compression socks and such to try and keep that edema out of the legs because um, uh, you basically have had uh, vascular failure um, of that venous system and just it's no longer able to properly circulate. Um, tense edema becomes pretty marked in this stage. Again, um, you can see it pretty, uh, quite clearly in both those pictures. Um, blisters containing uh, serous or hemorrhagic fluid may form, indicating more severe injury. So you're getting, uh, if you're getting the hemorrhagic injury, you're usually going all the way down um, uh, through the dermis. And then if you're getting more of the serous stuff, you may be getting um, more of the epithelial and maybe upper dermis, uh, superficial dermis area that you're uh, getting that dermal epidermal uh, junction to um, kind of disassociate and form that blister. Um, superficial epidermis actually becomes thick, indurated, and desquamated. Escar scars can even form um, and eventually slow off, leaving a really pink dermis. So these aren't scars like uh, we were talking about earlier. These are more um more superficial eye scars they don't go all the way down through the entire uh, the entirety of the dermis they are able to slough off on their own and eventually epithelialization is able to uh, occur occur underneath it and uh while it's uh kind of uh detaching and and form so that's why you have that pink um a little bit of pink dermis uh, left behind, and then that just further epithelializes uh, by overgrowth um, after that eschar falls off. Um, muscles uh, might show weakness with uh, impaired electrical responses. So if you did um, a ECT test and everything and tested, tested electrical response, it would probably be slow conductivity. Um, you also have a slowing of uh, your reflexes, and then also you start getting a bit of uh, muscle atrophy as well because the innervation has been damaged to those muscles. Milder cases, the stage uh, peaks at about 24 hours. More severe cases, the hyperemic phase may take 6 to 10 weeks to resolve. And then people who have had multiple insults to injury, multiple episodes of trimp foot, often uh, are going to have issues um, for several months, even years. And that kind of brings us into the post-hyperemic phase. So uh, this phase kind of lacks uh, any obvious signs. Uh, in mild cases, this phase might be absent entirely. In uh, moderate cases, weeks to months. Uh, in severe cases, years. Um, and it all comes back to how often they were getting this uh, non-freezing cold injury, how often they were going back into the mush without uh, properly um, uh, wearing, uh, changing their socks, uh, doing uh, what they could do to, to prevent uh, it from reoccurring. So after about six to 10 weeks, patients often complain about spontaneous hyperhidrosis. So basically you had anhydrosis and the um, hyperemic phase. Now you're having uh, spontaneous hyperhidrosis. So tons of sweat rashes and stuff like that are common. Heavy perspiration in the feet. Um, on a warm day, socks are usually quickly soaked. Extremities may uh, sweat excessively, even when cold. Um, so the hyperhidrosis also uh, predisposes these individuals to a, a chronic paranicule infection. So lots of fungal infections of the toes. So lots of older soldiers and uh, or older veterans and stuff you'll see with really gnarly toenails and that and that sort of thing is because they had trench foot uh, back in Vietnam and uh, and then uh, they have this post hyperemic phase in which they have hyperhidrosis. They soak their socks. They they get fungal infections and as many of you know, uh, fungal uh, infections of the toenails are. <laughs> quite hard to get rid of, super annoying. So um, that's why you kind of see it in these individuals. Um, the paresthesia and extreme pain uh, are typical of the hyperemic phase are usually resolved by now. Now more you're getting the dull aches, anesthesia, and that, that can persist for years and years and years. Um, so dull, achy feet, um, you are, are most likely uh, going to continue having vascular issues in the future. So maybe not edema as quite as bad as the hyperemic phase, but as you get older, um, you've already had that vascular uh, insult, and so it's going to be much more easier to have uh, vascular insufficiency uh, going forwards. Uh, and like I said, recurrent edema of feet, return of paresthesia, and often blistering are common, uh, especially after walking or doing anything for a long time that keeps you in an upright position and have blood pooling down into the legs. 
Intrinsic muscle and ligament atrophy tend to resolve in severe cases. Fiber scarring may lead to rigidity, permanent contracture of the toes, and that sort of thing. Again, sometimes why you see really gnarly toes in uh, veterans. Um, Decalcification of bones are similar to that of osteoporosis, um, frequently observed. Uh, immobility and pain um, in severe cases may lead to prolonged convalescence for six or more, more months, even after the hyperemic phase. Um, depending on how severe the case was, it can lead to immobility for quite a long time. Most severe cases, you can even get gangrene to develop, um, in which you need ablative surgery to, or even amputations to, to cure it. Um, Neuropathic tissue susceptible to local trauma, ulceration, local osteomyelitis, all that sort of stuff. So same, same stuff you get with uh, diabetics with peripheral neuropathy, basically. Uh, and you have the same uh, behavior as the neuropathic foot. Um, and if someone is diabetic already, um, and even uh, these individuals with tr uh, recurrent trench foot and eventually bad post-hyperemic phase, um, they often are predisposed to infections, usually um, polymicrobial um, uh, with staph, strep, um, and that sort of thing. Um, just something uh, uh, to be aware of. Pseudomonas is also something that is quite common in, in these uh, individuals. But all right. Here's just some more photos uh, taken from the Willard's Fasten textbook on uh, uh, on trench foot and, and different types of severity. Um, uh, and probably the most severe would be uh, the Argentinian, Argentinian miner um, that had very, very severe uh, non-freezing injury. Wore his boots for 47 days straight during the Falklands War. So um, basically had recurring episodes probably on the daily of um, trench foot and this uh, uh, non-freezing uh, cold injury to the point where he had um, complete destruction of the, his tissues and gangrene development. And that was the result. So this is probably the upper end uh, of a severity that you can get. Let's talk about treatment now. We're talking about how you get it, how you treat it. Now, I do want to say I've talked mostly about soldiers in this context, but this is not limited to soldiers. Please do not think it's limited to soldiers. This is limited to anybody uh, that wears boots and socks and does not properly take care of their feet uh, when they're going on long hikes, hikes working anywhere that is a wet, marshy environment, um, or just not uh, worrying about changing um, their socks or boots uh, for days on end. So... Um, Let's talk about treatment. Because painful rewarming and persistent pain are features of non-freezing cold injuries, it's important to try and alleviate the pain early stage. Um, so uh, trying to take uh, aspirin, ibuprofen, anything uh, when you're uh, off-site to be able to do that. If you have anybody coming in um, to be treated uh, for, for trench foot uh, in the um, emergency care setting, which, you know, you don't see it too terribly often. Usually you see more of the sequelae in the post-hyperemic phase and that sort of thing when you're seeing people in the clinical setting. But if you do see it, um, you can use some stronger analgesics, but uh, really um, uh, trying to focus more more in on the neuropathic pain modulators than anything else. Um, effective ex uh, extremities should uh, never be rubbed because it can compound the injury. So basically, you have hyperperfused uh, that tissue with um, fluid, and you can cause sloughing off if you rub it too vigorously. You can cause in in increased damage to underlying tissue as well. So you want to be very careful to not vigorously rub anything. Um, Treatment is uh, limited to symptomatic pain relief, basically, and, rele and reversing the ischemia as best you can, while uh, subsequently uh, minimizing progression of the disease. So drying off the feet, keeping them warm uh, going forward, that sort of thing, not putting them back into cold, wet boots, not get letting them uh, be further injured. So basically, when you realize it's happened, don't let it happen again. Um, Rewarming injured tissues increases metabolic demand of damaged cutaneous cells to a greater extent uh, than can be provided by um, the supply capability of the injured uh, blood vessels. So basically, if you rewarm uh, the tissues uh, to a great degree, um, you don't have the vasculature that can uh, maintain it. So basically, you up the metabolism in the injured feet, but you don't have vasculature to feed them, and you can cause further tissue ischemia and damage. So kind of the same way heart attacks work is, you know, you up the, the metabolic uh, demands of the heart. It wants more oxygen, but you're not getting enough perfusion. And so uh, you start having death of, of uh, cardiac tissue. So very much the same, same principle. Um, 
Tissue anoxia and endothelial cell injury coupled with reflex vasodilation leads to uh, fluid transdation, uh, increased edema, skin necrosis, worsening pain. So all these things, if you up the metabolic demands without getting proper reperfusion, these are, these are some of the consequences, basically. Um, so instead, your core temperature must be rise while keeping the extremities kind of cool. Not saying you stick them in an ice bucket or something, but basically wor worrying more about um, uh, rewarming uh, someone's core temperature and uh, not focusing on rewarming the actual extremity in question. Um, extremity cooling lowers uh, metabolic requirements to the point where the vascular oxygen supply can sustain the tissue demand. Okay, so basically, uh, if you can warm somebody, put them in a couple jackets, nice warm pants, everything, put their feet on a table and uh, keep a nice fan blowing across them. So keeping them cool, uh, but also dry. That can actually keep the tissue uh, demands low for oxygen. So even though you're not able to get that um, redilation of those vessels quite soon, uh, you aren't upping their uh, demand and you're able to um, keep any kind of tissue ischemia and further damage from occurring. Um, uh, continuous cooling brings rapid improvement in pain, actually, edema and uh, vesiculation. So uh, basically, uh, keeping the, the extremely cool will keep you from uh, forming a lot of these to the severity that you uh, you would expect. And the cooling should be continued until the pain is completely relieved uh, and circulation has recovered and the hyperema has subsided. That is how you pretty much treat trench foot. So a little different than anything else we've talked about so far. All right, so our last bit about trench foot is tr uh, how to prevent it. So we kind of talked about how it happens. What can I do to kind of prevent this from happening? Because I'm scared to go hiking with my boots now. Well, uh, preventing uh, trench foot, you can uh, avoid uh, prolonged exposure to cold wet environments. That's basically the first thing you can do. Don't go hiking in wet marshy lands without proper uh, boots that uh, keep water from invading uh, and your feet getting wet and cold. Um, encourage activities that promote blood flow to the feet. So uh, biking actually, even though there's a pair of biking shoes over there, biking actually uh, uh, helps blood flow uh, kind of just all over the place because you're uh, having good uh, muscular contraction in the feet. You're getting good um, movement of uh, blood within the vasculature. Um, running, anything that's basically having good lower leg contraction and, um, and movement, you're helping promote blood flow to the feet. Um, Rotating personnel out of cold, wet environments on a regular basis. So this is more for anybody um, who's working in a wet environment. Say uh, you have a bunch of wilderness guides or something who go uh, do, do daily tours and stuff like that. Rot put them on a rotating schedule and stuff so they're not constantly bogging down their feet and stuff on a day-in, day-out basis. Keep feet dry by chain, uh, early changing of wet socks. So if your socks get wet, have a couple of extra pairs on hand to uh, change them out and stop over to change them quickly. Don't wait forever to, to get them changed. Um, maintain your core body temperature by limiting sweat accumulation into clothing by dressing in layers and also using more sports fabrics, that sort of stuff, moisture wicking layers, stuff that kind of protects you from building up a lot of sweat and stuff within the clothes. Um, and then even if your uh, feet are relatively dry, um, changing socks two to three times during the day is kind of a mandatory thing in cold butt environments if you want to prevent trench foot. The military actually suggests uh, that optimum, optimal care entails air drying feet for at least eight, hour, eight hours of every 24 hours. So um, maybe if you're at a campsite or something else, walking around barefoot or in sandals. Um, vapor barrier boots do not uh, allow sweat to evaporate. So it prevents water from getting in, but doesn't allow sweat to evaporate. Um, and it can also increase maceration if you're not careful. So they should be taken off uh, each day, wiped and removed moisture and debris inside. And then you also probably need to even change your socks out more often if you have the, that good barrier boot. Um, just to make sure you don't get a buildup of sweat inside and, and your socks getting damp. Um, and generally, uh, kind of general considerations is footwear should not constrict blood flow. Uh, sizing is important um, and basically try not to keep too tight uh, fit on your foot, not tying your suit laces too tight or anything like that. You should, should have good blood flow for, to your feet. Alrighty, next let's talk about pernio or chillblains. So this is a localized inflammatory uh, reaction that causes bluish red lesions, usually occurring on the toes or tips of fingers. Um, it's usually caused by an abnormal reaction to a cold, damp environment. So talking about more non-freezing cold injuries. Um, Pernia is believed to be caused by prolonged cold-induced vasoconstriction with subsequent hypoxemia, 
um, and vessel wall inflammation. Um, acutely, it has a seasonal incidence usually, um, and um, w it, the symptoms are usually reversible um, uh, with, when you warm up the extremities. Uh, most often, people experience these uh, symptoms in, the first time during the winter. So if you have somebody coming in with these kind of uh, dermolo dermatological findings, uh, middle of winter, haven't had them any time before, uh, chill blanks should be pretty high on your list. The acute form is seen primarily in school children uh, and young adults under the age of 20, highest rate in adolescent females. So young girls is super common to see. Um, pernio can be caused by even a, just a brief 30 minutes cold exposure. Um, and it often appears several hours after the exposure with the skin lesions fully developed in about 12 to 24 hours. So it's not happening when they're cold, it's happening after they're cold. So uh, you might have to be a bit of a historian uh, to really suss out the clinical expectations uh, behind this to, to really make a definitive diagnosis. So uh, characteristic locations for these lesions are the feet, hands, legs, and even thighs. Um, usually you have single or multiple erythematous purplish um, edematous uh, lesions. And um, with really severe cases, you can have even uh, vesicles form. So um, make sure you're not uh, thinking more of the uh, hydrosis kind of th stuff. Um, and that both should be on your list, but just know that with severe forms, you can get those vesicles form. And they're quite burny and they're you know, very similar to hydrotic ex eczema. So just something to kind of keep in your back pocket. Um, symptoms include intense pruritus, <laughs> burning, pain, um, and then worsens by subsequent warmth. So you're kind of seeing that uh, with a lot of these non-freezing injuries is um, warmth actually intensifies the burning or the pain. Um, but it, uh, in this case, it's also what prevents it from occurring, as we'll go over in a sec. Um, the lesions uh, of acute pernio are self-limited, usually uh, resolve in a few days, to three weeks, and that's the skin, skin lesions, so, um, and occasionally leave a little bit of residual hyperpigmentation. But again, if it occurred once, it can occur again, especially if it's the colder months and they're not doing anything to fix their behavior, uh, causing the underlying problem. Although the healing process appears to occur um, after uh, the lesions resolve, resolve, the pain actually can persist a bit longer as well. Um, subsequent mild uh, cold exposures may trigger paresthesias, edema, even skin scaling as well. Right, and the treatment. Treatment is accomplished by drying and gently massaging the affected skin. Um, Active warming above 86 degrees Fahrenheit significantly worsens the pain. It should be avoided. Don't put hot pads around the feet trying to warm them quickly. Warm them slowly. Um, actually, recently, nifedipine, um, 20 milligrams, three times daily, has been shown to be an effective treatment for per uh, severe perineal. So um, for young adolescent girls who are experiencing this quite severely, in the winter or have been experiencing it, uh, you know, all their lives, older women, um, I say women, it could happen to men too, but, you know, more, more prevalent in women, um, you can do a trial of nifedipine, you know, only if they're not having any um, uh, cardiovascular issues that they're already taking other medications for and stuff and see if that can actually uh, resolve their symptoms, even if they only need to take it during those colder winter months. Um, patients treated uh, usually had a significantly reduced time for clearance of lesions, um, decreased pain, irritation of existing lesions and less development of new lesions. So it, it seems to work pretty well. Um, other prophylactic measures include minimizing cold exposure um, by using suitable clothing anytime when outdoors and it really just kind of getting at the core of the issue is keeping those uh, toes warm. All right. All right. Cryoglobulinemia. So cryoglobulins are cold precipitable uh, serum immunoglobulins. So they, these are the same immunoglobulins you're thinking of um, that you form to fight disease. So um, IgG, IgA, IgM, all that sort of stuff. The thing uh, that we're talking mostly with uh, cryoglobulinemia is IgG and IgM. So let's just talk about the uh, different types real quick. Type 1 cryoglobulins 
um, composed of IgG primarily, uh, not, not usually uh, the most common case. Type 2 um, is uh, a combination of IgG and IgM. Um, usually ha also has rheumatoid factor positive in these individuals. This is pretty much the, the usual case of individuals who, who develop this, is 50 to 60 percent of cases. The other most common type is type 3, uh, which is also a um, combination of IgG and IgM fractions without the rheumatoid factor uh, present. But basically what happens is uh, cold induces these uh, uh, immunoglobulins to precipitate um, and then uh, basically uh, form aggregates that prevent blood flow. And then you can start getting a lot of these particular hemorrhages. You get this lacy reticular pattern and that sort of stuff. This is just kind of an image just to give you uh, a feel of what we're talking about. Uh, again, the most common type is the mixed type, um, uh, where you have the IgM and the IgG. Again, the IgM is kind of like that five-pointed star. The IgG is more of the linear uh, form. Um, and IgG, IgM is actually uh, the worst part of this because it's larger, uh, and when it aggregates, it, it can quickly occlude vessels and uh, lead to vasculitis and, and uh, subsequently a lot of these um, uh, these kind of purpuritic changes with the, the lacy reticular patterns and petechiae and that kind of stuff. So like I said, in general, the higher protein concentration um, and the higher, uh, higher temperature at which the precipitation uh, begins. So uh, the IG, uh, IgM, um, higher protein concentration bigger, um, can uh, clude faster and also um, precipitates in even lower temperatures, or sorry, in even higher temperatures. So it's the first one uh, to cause occlusion. So that's why kind of this mixed form with IgM and IgG, uh, the type 2, is more prevalent and, and causes the most issues. Um, Hepatitis C is actually considered a principal trigger for forming cryoglobulinemia. So uh, somebody has recently or in the past had um, uh, hepatitis C is our more predisposition to forming these immunoglobulins that can preci uh, precipitate. Um, serum cryoglobulin values do not usually correlate with clinical severity, actually. So it's not the amount you have. Um, but... Uh, uh, disease it doesn't really uh, talk about disease prognosis, but uh, it can serve as a clinical marking of the disease. So just having the, the cryoglobulins kind of shows you the, the type of disease. And again, with type 2, if you have rheumatoid factor as well, that kind of really leads you uh, to hone in on this. So if you have a patient who does not have a history of hepatitis C but has um, the serum cryoglobulins and rheumatoid factor, or plus or minus. I mean, if you have type 1 or type 3, uh, you could also um, be having it. But anyway, basically, if you have, uh, have these findings, you should also do a hepatitis panel on the patient and make sure they don't have a current infection of hepatitis C that you need to be considering uh, for treatment, okay? So some uh, conditions associated with cryoglobulinemia, not just hep C, other infections including viral, bacterial, fungal, so there are a bunch of them, I didn't bother listing all of them. Um, you can have it with many hematological uh, diseases, so um, uh, chronic uh, lymphocytic leukemia, multiple myeloma, any of the autoimmune diseases. Uh, so there's a lot of things that can correlate with it and cause formation of these cryoglobulins. It's just that uh, hepatitis C is considered like the prominent trigger, what we see in most patients. All right, let's talk about kind of the symptoms you're going to see. So cryoglobulinemia characterized by pretty much a triad. So you have the purpura, you have weakness, and you have arthralgias. And you, again, looking down at that right lower pattern, you also have some of the lacy reticular stuff. You can have some edema uh, and that sort of thing. So, But the purpura, weakness, and arthralgias are kind of the big ones. Um, Often they initially present with uh, skin lesions, uh, similar to Raynaud's or vasomotor attacks. So suddenly having a really white finger um, that eventually goes back to normal, that kind of stuff. You know, something that is kind of cluing you in that there's some kind of occlusive process going on in the vasculature. Um, remember that uh, Raynaud's has a very specific finding of, of colors. So first it turns uh, red. Um, then it turns blue, then it turns white. So you have to have all three colors for it to be more considered the Renaud's uh, phenomenon. And that is very, very characteristic of it. If you're not getting quite all the colors, then that can also tell you, hey, I need to look for something else. Um, mucosal bleeding, uh, visual disturbances, abdominal pain are less common but can occur. 
Uh, cold sensitivity is uh, apparent in less than one half of these patients. So even though um, the cold is precipitating um, these uh, these cryoglobulins uh, to come out, uh, it, do it doesn't necessarily mean that patients are cold sensitive. So they can be developing this, these symptoms after the cold exposure, kind of similar to uh, Pernia was. Um, symptoms uh, associated with uh, cryoglobulins uh, uh, can also include uh, uh, purpura, cutaneous vasculitis with ulceration. So you can have ulcerative uh, problems going on. So if you look at that top right and even on the bottom uh, right, there's a, a couple of ulcerations. You can see um, basically that tissue uh, destruction causing it. Um, you can also have retinal hemorrhages, co coagulopathies, glomerulin fries, renal failures, cerebral thrombosis, all the things, all the bad things. Basically anything that can be caused by any vascular occlusion um, you can have. Um, hopefully not everyone gets these and you get away with more of the purpura arthralgias and stuff. All right, and let's finally talk about a little bit of the treatment for cryoglobulinemia. Um, it's kind of um, in intense and difficult. I mean, this is something you're more going to be talking about uh, with a rheumatologist, or if you're in a rural area and you're, you're um, a uh, family doc and you're taking care of these kind of patients, then you could possibly be delving more in, uh, into this sort of stuff. But this is just kind of give you a general idea of what's um, going on. Uh, one, again, you're going to be checking for HCV uh, to see if they're infected. If they don't have a history of HCV or they have a history of HCV, but that was a long time ago or something, you can even recheck them, do a quick hepatitis panel, see what's going on. Um, and uh, if they do have a current uh, um, HCV burden, then the treatment of choice is actually to um, uh, target uh, treating the HCV. So using interferon, prednisone, rubvarin, um, and uh, doing all that. Uh, and if you get kind of thought of, hey, if the HCV is what is producing these immunoglobulins, if we take care of this, our B cells will stop producing those immunoglobulins and um, we'll hopefully be able to um, get, get rid of the precipitates for the most part. So that's just kind of um, the general idea. For non-associated uh, non-HCV associated cryoglobulinemia um, with mild to moderate symptoms, so you're getting the purpuras, the arthralgia, the neuropathy, immunosuppression with corticosteroids and analgesics is kind of the treatment of choice. Also, advise your patients to do a low antigen content diet, so rice, fresh vegetables, fruit, tea, that sort of stuff. Also, been shown to kind of improve um, clinical medicine, clinical manifestations with severe manifestations causing renal failure, neuro impairment. Uh, myalgias, um, anything that's causing really severe uh, vascular issues, then you can consider plasmapheresis um, every once in a while to reduce the, the burden of uh, the immunoglobulin burden um, and just do, do this um, every once in a while to, to, to suss them out and, and make sure that uh, you don't have enough to cause enough precipitation to cause these vasculitis uh, issues. So plasmapheresis is uh, used in, in conjunction with the corticosteroids in these individuals or other kinds of drugs. Um, and uh, usually because discontinuing uh, plasmapheresis treatment usually causes the reappearance of the, the cryoglobulinemia. So it's, it builds back up, unfortunately. So um, the HCV dependent type is much easier to treat, even though HCV is not fun to treat. I'm not saying that's that's easy to treat at all, um, but it's easier than treating the uh, non-associated type. So generally, treatment of these is not great. And then, you know, of course, prevention would be avoiding cold. And then you can also do the low antigen diet, uh, anything that can cause uh, upset. So that's kind of it for cryoglobulinemia. And for our last non-freezing cold injury, we're going to talk about cold urticaria. So anybody in primary care, these last uh, couple of topics uh, actually are really good for primary care. Yes, and especially this one is you're going to see cold urticaria um, quite a lot. So um, cold urticaria is basically characterized by the development of localized or generalized even uh, wheels and itching on skin after exposure to uh, cold. So this isn't just going outside cold. This is any cold ice cubes, uh, cold object, cold liquid, uh, glass in the hand of uh, ice cold drink. Any of this can onset it. Um, most frequently affects young adults for the duration of four to five years um, uh, after onset. And not saying they uh, stay and don't go away, but that's kind of the general length of time that um, it continues to occur. Um, 
And even though it occurs uh, most often in young adults, it can occur at any age, really. Women, again, are most likely to be affected, unfortunately. Um, symptoms usually limited to, to cold exposed areas. So the area that touched the cold object or uh, was wind blown or something like that usually causes redness, itching, wheels, edema, that sort of thing. So very characteristic pictures there on the right hand side, especially that lower right hand side of the wheels. Um, the wheels last about 30 minutes and then uh, slowly uh, start to fade. You can also sometimes get some systemic reactions uh, occurring, um, including fatigue, headaches, dyspnea, hypotension, anything that's kind of histamine um, uh, uh, reaction is kind of along those, those lines. It's very much like a hypersensitivity reaction. Uh, swimming in cold water is most common trigger of severe reactions. Um, and it's dangerous because it can lead to a full systemic um, release of that histamine, uh, causing hypotension, fainting, shock, and then if you're in the water, possibly death from drowning. Or even if you're not in the water, death from uh, suffocation. Um, uh, and suffocation also often uh, happens after uh, consuming extremely cold drinks, uh, resulting in that pharyngeal angioedema. So not just itching annoyance on the skin can also be quite, quite dangerous and something you want to talk to your patients about uh, watching uh, and being careful of. So the uh, cause of urticaria onset is really unknown, uh, other than those age groups and, and you know lasting four to five years. We don't really know why it happens, but we don't do know kind of how to diagnose it, and it's kind of obvious. Um, it's uh, to diagnose uh, uh, cold urticaria, uh, you do the ice cube test. So basically you fill a pan with cold water ice cubes uh, and then have them hold uh, their arm under the water uh, for uh, uh, for a couple of minutes, uh, or however long they can stand it, you know, uh, cold water, actually, a cold ice water is hard to hold uh, hands in, but you can also just do an ice cube against the skin for three to five minutes or something equivocal. Basically, you want something cold, uh, and then to be, uh, in prolonged contact with it. Um, and then uh, usually uh, the onset of the wheels and, and formation is going to happen within uh, five to 15 minutes after exposure. Um, and if it if it occurs, then you have your positive diagnosis, basically. Um, so cold urticaria has been associated with viral and bacterial infections, as well as infections of the upper respiratory tract, teeth, neurogenital tract. But we haven't found any real causative agent. Um, and we really think that the the method behind it uh, is the histamine, leukotriene, and other mast cell mediators kind of just uh, vomiting their contents all over the place, causing that histamine-induced um, uh, uh, inflammation and, and hypersensitivity effects. So um, they also think uh, that it's most likely uh, kind of mediated by IgG, IgE and IgM as well. So again, um, kind of connecting uh, IgE, uh, connecting those mast cells, causing degranulation, that sort of stuff. Uh, support for the IgE um, mechanism kind of comes from successful treatment of those severe cases with omalizumab, which is an anti-IgE uh, uh, component. And for a final slide, how to treat cold urticaria. So uh, treating with antihistamines is actually the most effective option other than just avoidance of, you know, cold things. Um, so treating with antihistamines uh, reduces uh, pretty much that symptomatic, you know, histamine, inflammation, um, uh, degranulation response, basically. Um, but to efficiently reduce uh, symptoms, sometimes you need dosing of up to four times the recommended, recommended dose. So this is something you kind of got to um, uh, work on with pediatric patients and see what is going to be the pro uh, appropriate dosage for them because uh, they already take a, a less strong dose of antihistamines than adults do. So kind of being careful of how that works. You also don't want... Um, uh, to use so much that they're zonked out or, or bouncing off the walls or anything, depending on um, which particular uh, antihistamine you're using. But um, individuals with uh, severe reactions should also have an emergency kit that contains corticosteroids, um, antihistamines, and epinephrine. So the epinephrine being the, the most important key part. And again, it's just like uh, the, the hypersensitive reactions after uh, they've injected themselves with the epinephrine, they do need to go to the hospital because once the effects of the epinephrine wear off, they can have subsequent um, reactivation of the, the uh, histamine effects, and it can be a, a pretty big issue. Um, so that's, that's something to to, to be aware of and really counsel with your patients, especially if they start uh, developing any more severe reactions. Um, 
So uh, based on findings that infectious disease may be a trigger for cold urticaria, earlier treatment with antibiotics uh, for infectious diseases may be warranted. I think that's kind of, you know, provider's choice. Um, if you're finding it uh, more prevalent in the area you're working with, especially rural population, um, uh, and that you're finding it very prevalent within families and, and subsequent generations and that sort of thing, then maybe thinking that, you know, hey, there is a genetic predisposition here after they get sick uh, with some kind of um, viral bacterial um, uh, incident, then they uh, eventually subsequently uh, start forming this cold urticaria. So there's a lot more uh, research to be formed on this, but uh, I would I would just treat patients how you normally treat with viral and, and bacterial infections and then um, treat them accordingly if they do uh, kind of start uh, presenting with this cold ur urticaria stuff. All right. This is the end of the Burton and Bites lecture series, so just two videos. So thank you guys so much for listening to me. Again, if you have any questions, please post them down in the comments below. If you have any corrections, um, any updated information, uh, any personal experiences, stuff you'd like to share that you think would be helpful for others, please also post that. I love hearing and, and seeing all that. Um, and then if you guys need anything else for references, uh, Auerbach, uh, Wilderness Medicine Text, almost all of this was taken uh, from that textbook. It's very, uh, uh, very comprehensive and you can, uh, it, it's pretty up to date as well. There's also a newer version, the, uh, I believe it's a 2020 version actually. So I just got uh, uh, updated. And so that's a really awesome resource for you guys to use. All right. Thanks so much.